Franchi Talks Japanese. I'm, I am Franchi, and we're back with the second episode of the History of Japanese Art series. And today we're going to talk about the, the art produced on the Japanese archipelago during the Yayo period. Now, the Yayo period is usually indicated to start from around 300 before Common Era and to last until the year 300 CE. Now, these dates are not <laughs> exactly defined and they're always being researched and revisited, but in general, we can see that it's kind of a shorter period, for example, when compared to the previous period, we talked about the Jomon, which lasted more than 10,000 years. So this might end up even being a shorter video. We'll see how well how that goes. And um, we need to point out, though, that the beginning of the Yayoi and the end of the Jomon period, they are not events that started and happened overnight. Actually, the Yayoi period is named after the Yayoi culture and the Jomon period is also named after the Jomon culture. These two cultures, they coexisted for some time on the Japanese archipelago. But for this channel and the scope of this video, I think it's good enough to just use the dates that are traditionally indicated and Yayoi period is also divided into early, middle, and late. So we put a little scheme here for you to have a look and get yourself comfortable with the dating. The way in which the Yayoi period and the culture of the Yayoi period differs from the Jomon period is in certain skills and techniques that were acquired during this new period. And most important of all is probably the cultivation of rice. There is evidence that rice was being cultivated already during the Jomon period. For example, some bits of rice were found in a pot that dates was carbon dated to that era. However, rice was surely not stable in the food and cultivation of rice was not a main effort. But during the Yaya period, uh, cultivation of rice was a main focus of the people. And the second new skill which was developed in this period is metal work. We said that Jomon people, they use tools made of stone, but in this period metal is being used, the people know how to make it, and this means new tools and it also means weapons, new weapons like swords. We mentioned then that the Yayoi period, the Yayoi is a new people, a new culture which has these new skills. And how did this new culture arrive? How did it start? There are several theories about this and they are also <laughs> being debated just like the dating of the period. Uh, so I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not going to go super deep into this topic, but I will just give a theory or two and uh, it's critique, let's say. So if we look at uh, the theory which is put forward in the book of History of Art in Japan by Tsuji Nobu, he simply states that this new culture arrived from the Korean Peninsula. So new people came from the Korean Peninsula, they arrived in the Japanese archipelago, they brought with themselves these new skills and they started using them. His, in his theory, uh, these people are came in rather small numbers and they did not put up fights, they did not battle with the old population already present in the Japanese archipelago, so the Jomon. They simply arrived, brought the new skills with themselves and started collaborating with the people already present. So rice cultivation is seen as the product of a collaboration. On the other hand, if we look at the history of Japanese art by Penelope Mason, she puts forward different possibilities which are different from the one of a kind of immigration. She states that yes, this technology probably originated in the Korean Peninsula, however they were not brought in by new people. She thinks that people from the Japanese archipelago 
travel to the Korean Peninsula, uh, learn the skills, and then travel back to the Japanese archipelago, bringing the skills with themselves, and start uh, cultivating rice, for example, or working mecca. Now, however, this happened. It did bring about big changes in the life of the people of the Japanese archipelago. For example, probably because of uh, rice cultivation, bigger settlements started being created. People were living in bigger settlements and they also constructed new and bigger buildings. And some of them are, for example, storehouses. Now, storehouses are very interesting to look at first because it means there was a surplus, for example, of food that needed to be stored. Secondly, we can see how they were built. For example, they were built in a way that in which they were raised. And this comes from two reasons. The first one is that having their storehouse elevated, it means that there is a kind of gap between the food and the house itself and the ground. So this permits a good aeration and it means that uh, they won't create as much as humidity and so the food will last longer and it will stay fresher. And the second reason is that it also keeps it kind of safer <laughs> from animals which might want to eat the food which is contained in the storehouse. But the reason I'm talking about them is also that in their structure, in their being elevated, it is also it has also been theorized that they did influence the architecture that was to come later in the Japanese history, for example, the ones of shrines. Now, we said that there was an influx of new materials which were being used and new skills to craft objects, but we still have to say that earthenware <laughs> was still the, one of the main materials used to produce objects. Some things never change. So we're going to have to spend some time looking at ceramics. Uh, just like during the German period, ceramics uh, were also the, the object that originated the studies on the culture on this period and which gave them their name. So yayoi, um, the study of the Yayoi period also started when some shards of ceramics were found and they were found in a district in Tokyo from which they take their name Yayoi. So let's look at the ceramics. As I mentioned, the Jomon and the Yayoi cultures coexisted for some time, so both styles of making ceramics coexisted. And we can also see that Yayoi ceramics have certain things in common with Jomon and then certain things are different. So the things that are in common, for example, is that they are also made of simple earthenware, which was not glazed. And they are fired in open pits because they there was no kilns, they hadn't developed kilns to fire ceramics. The way in which they seem to different, differ is a main product which was produced, which in the case of the German seemed to be in kind of a pot shape, but in the case of the Yayo it seems to be more in a jar shape. And they do prefer this kind of jars, often they have long, thin necks and wide open mouths. Something that is really interesting is that it seems that the Yaya, it seems that they had a preference for, let's say, finding a balance between aesthetic and um, functionality. So I will take this. Uh, jar as an, exa an example it's from the collection of the Met Museum in New York we can see that uh, the people who made this jar they did have a specific interest uh, in aesthetics they did keep um, the beauty of the object in mind because for example we can see that it has a rounded shape and it's perfectly symmetrical and then they chose to burnish part of the Pot as a decoration but at the same time it's not overly decorated we can see that it's actually quite a simple and sturdy object which means that it was also made by for it was also made by keeping in mind its functionality 
while uh, on the other hand we can remember some of the uh, pots made by the German, you can see them in my other video, they go all out <laughs> on aesthetics, I don't know how much there was for functionality back then. And in general we can see that some of these pots of the Yaya people, they were made by stacking coils of uh, clay and then smoothing them out. And the decoration is often of a simple inside line work, which was made by using a comb and dragging onto the surface of the clay, which was still like half dry, half wet. We can see some other examples, for example, this one also from the collection of the Night Museum. This one also presents its a thin, long neck. But we can see that in this uh, in this example, the decoration has been applied also with the, not only the inside line work but applied bands of ceramic. And then, if we talk about point of commonality with the German pottery, we can also see, for example, this uh, vase. It shows a human face and human faces, human features or animal features are present both in the pottery of the Jomon people and of the Yayoi people. Now, let's make a bit of a change and stop talking about ceramics and let's talk about metal objects. So metallurgy was developed during the Yayoi period and we have to say that many objects made of metal, they came originally from China and Korea and they were imported into Japan. And then the people of the Japanese archipelago also developed how to make these objects themselves. One of the main metals, or the main metal which was used at the time was bronze. Bronze, was, bronze is not a natural material, it's not found as bronze in nature, but it is a metal alloy, it's made from copper and tin, so it requires uh, finding these two resources and then combining them to make bronze. So it takes a certain amount of skills. <laughs> so it's a big deal that this skill was developed. And some of the metal objects that we can find in this video, they are, for example, swords, spearheads, mirrors, and bells. And we will look at some of these objects in this video and some will come in the next video about the coffin period. For example, I will reserved talking about mirrors for the coffin period. So let's talk about bells. Bells were originated in China where they were known as Zhong or Pian Zhong. I hope I am pronouncing this correctly. I'm trying my best here. And uh, there they were originally used to hang from the necks of animals. Although there are many bells which are also found in tombs and they were therefore used in a funerary context and possibly also had ritual purpose. And then they were also found and moved, brought into the Korean Peninsula where we can find them. And in the Korean Peninsula they also adopted some kind of ritual purposes and then they were brought into Japan and the same there they seem to have been connected to some kind of rituals, for example, because they are found often buried on top of inns, in uh, alone or in couples, and sometimes we are with spearheads, so it seems that maybe they were connected to rituals that had to do with agriculture and fertility, Well, we don't know for sure how they were used. The bells in Japanese, they are known as dotaku, so we mentioned that they first were imported and then the Japanese people started producing them themselves. And the first one that we find in the Yaya period are actually rather small and very simply decorated or almost not decorated. And then during the middle Yaya period they started being bigger, around 30-40 centimeters high. And they also have more decoration and they present a kind of fin around the frame, around the body of the bell itself and then they become even bigger in the late Yayo period for example they are mm, more than one meter high and they are extremely decorated 
and the decoration on the bells of the Yayoi period. First of all, it seems to more very often present or almost always present a geometric decoration. Usually, it's some kind of line work that creates certain bends, which are the vertical or horizontal, and they create some kind of square left blank in the between each bend. I will, it's hard to explain, but you can look at the picture and understand it in one glance. And then sometimes the, these squares are left blank, or sometimes they're also decorated. And they, for example, present patterns of water, they can present human figures, and sometimes animals. But towards the end of the Yayo period, around in the 2nd century CE, hey, Towards the end of the Yaya period, around um, the second century CE, actually um, bell stopped being made. And it has been theorized that it could be because there is a kind of rise in the fighting and wars. And so using such a big amount of metal for such objects which only had ritual purposes was actually not doable anymore. And so they disappeared and they were replaced as ritual objects by mirrors, which we're going to see in our next video. Now we mentioned that weapons were made for fighting. However, not only weapons were also made for ritual purposes. And so it happened during the Yayoi period and we can look at them. Specifically, we can look at these bronze spearheads. This one is from the collection of the British Museum. And they were made for, as we think, ritual purposes because they are rather wide and their, their tip is not sharp and also at the bottom of it there is uh, no hole to connect it to an actual spear, to a stick. So we think they had no practical use and they were made for ceremonial or ritual purposes. Now concluding, talking about the Yayoi period, we can see that there is a lot of points of breaks and points of continuity with the Jomon. We have to keep this in mind. And at the same time, while the Jomon was a culture which was 100% from the Japanese archipelago, uh, the one of the Yaya was also influenced, to say the least, from, from the continent, such as from the Korean Peninsula and China. And we're going to see in the next video, in the Kofun period, there will also be points of breaks and points of continuity between the Yayoi and the Kofun. So I hope you enjoyed this video about the Yayoi people and its material culture. I did enjoy researching for it and making it. And uh, of course, uh, let, feel free to let me know what you think in the comments. Or if you want, you can subscribe to my channel because there will be, of course, more videos about Japanese art history. And if you want to keep in touch, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. Usually, I try to post there about my other research into Japanese art and also resources that I have and find online about Japanese art, of course. And if you want to support me, you can decide to... Uh, offer me a coffee or leave me a tip on the website Ko-Fi. I will set link that the website and then everything else in the description down below. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye!